right, so welcome back to the vlog. I'm currently reporting from where I play every Sunday. It's like a rec league, soccer league thing. Not very serious. I also play on Tuesdays in a much more competitive league. But you probably don't care too much about soccer. Although some of you guys say that you want to see like more personal stuff about my life. So here you go. This is what it looks like playing random soccer here on a uh, Tuesday. No, sorry, Sunday night. Poker players never know the day of the week. But anyway, the reason I'm making this video is because the previous week I played twice at Hustler and my intention was to not make a vlog from these two sessions because you know, sometimes it's nice to just play poker and not have to tell YouTube about it even though I am technically a poker vlogger, I guess you could say. But it turns out I played some really interesting hands between these two days. So I thought it would just be a disservice to the YouTube channel not to include them and share them with you guys. Some of you have seen these hands already, obviously. Most of you probably haven't, so enjoy, and I'll check in with you guys after the sessions and also after my soccer game, which ends in about two hours. So, see you guys on the other side. Right, guys underway once more here to go over some hustler hands we have quite a few today so i'm going to go through these a little bit quickly and the first interesting one i looked down at seven five of clubs in late position we are playing 50 100 on a friday I make it 300 bucks and get re-raised by mike x in the big blind to 1700 now mike is someone who typically plays quite solid pre-flop so with a hand like seven five suited i'm hoping to hit something and crack perhaps an over pair, or maybe he hits top pair with, you know, ace king or whatnot. So I make the call in position and we go to a flop of four, three, two with a club. That is about the best seven high I could hope for to have. We've got a backdoor flush draw and an open-ended straight draw. So when Mike checks, I decide to start bluffing right away. I make it a thousand. He makes the call and we see the queen of diamonds on the turn. He checks again and now, well, if I had something strong like a set or a straight, I would continue piling money into the pot. So with a bluff, I think it makes sense to do the exact same thing. I put in 4,000 bucks, hoping to fold out ace highs or perhaps pocket pairs below the queen like jacks or tens. But Mike X makes the call again, so it seems he's definitely got something. Looking for some help on the river, and that's exactly what we get. It's the six of hearts giving me the nuts. And I'm not going to lie, I didn't expect this one, but I'm more than happy to see it. Mike X checks again, and at this point, he's got a little over pot behind. So I just shove all in, and we get pretty much snap called. Turns out it was a perfect run out for me as the turn gave him top pair, and the river gives me the winning hand. So we're going to start this night off with a $46,000 pot headed our way. So that hand was fairly smooth sailing. This one is kind of the opposite. The straddle is on for 200, and I raise on the button to 500 bucks with 10-3 suited. A little bit wide, but here we are. Dan now re-raises, but he makes it super small. 1,800 out of the big blind. I'm probably gonna just fold anyway though, despite the small size, because my hand is just not quite good. But then Mike X cold calls in the straddle, so we're getting an amazing price to continue. In fact, I think that should lean me even more towards folding, because now we have to play this trash hand three ways instead of heads up. But at the same time, like I said, we're getting a really good deal to call. It's only 1300 more into a pot that's now 42 and change. So I get in there, we've got position, and if we miss, we can just fold. If we hit, we'll continue. That's my plan, at least, when we go to a flop of queen, nine, deuce with one spade. Not much going on for me, aside from some backdoor possibilities, which I probably won't get to see. But then Dan only bets 1000 and Mike X makes the call. So once more, similar to the flop, we are getting a great price to continue in position with some backdoor potential. So I toss in the thousand and we get the dream turn card. It's the Jack of Spades, suddenly improving my hand from a measly 10 high to, well, we've still got 10 high, but now it's an open-ended straight draw and a flush draw to go along with it. So all sorts of stuff going on for me. Dan now checks, Mike X checks, and well, it's on me, and if I had king 10 or 10 8 suited or two pair or you know anything like that, I would probably bet. So I decide to start bluffing now, hoping to catch these guys off guard with a single pair holding, 
and potentially win this pot one way or another right here on the turn or on the river. I put in $6,000 and this is where the hand gets really weird because Dan now check raises to 20,000. And this is quite unorthodox to say the least. This is a board that generally favors me more than him. So it's a little bit odd to uh, see this. Mike X now folds and when it's back to me, well, despite the fact that his play seems weird to me at least, We've got a pretty straightforward call with all our potential outs. Not only are we getting an okay price to see the river, but we've got something called implied odds going on, which means that if he's got something super strong, we can make more money on the river since he's going to have 66,000 behind. So I make the call a little bit frustrated, not going to lie about having this many chips in the pot with a hand this bad, but the run out just sort of came out perfectly for me to play the hand this way. So here we are. Going to a river, which is not great. It's the 10 of clubs, so we make a pair, I guess, but not much else aside from that. Dan, as you guys can see, has gotten there with what he thought was a bluff bottom pair on the turn. Turns out he had the best hand all along, and now definitely so, as he makes a king high straight. He thinks for a bit and shoves all in, and of course, I just let it go right away. This was quite a weird hand, and we didn't need to lose this many chips, but... That's how it goes sometimes. Shortly after that, we get back to playing good cards. In this one, Mike X opens from late position, and I decide to put in the re-raise from the small blind with pocket tens. I make it 5K to go. Mike X makes the call in position with a suited ace. Pretty standard so far, and we go to a flop of 9-3 deuce rainbow. I continue for a small bet of $3,000. Pretty innocuous board, so don't need to bet too big in a re-raised pot. Mike X has an overcard, backdoor flush, backdoor straight, and he's getting a good price in position, so he makes the call. So far, this hand is quite standard. Turn card is a five of hearts, and now we have a question between continuing to bet or checking for deception slash pot control. I decide to continue betting. I feel like if he's got a nine, we're going to get called, and there are also some potential draws like pair plus straight draws that we can get some value from. So I put in $11,000. And now Mike X thinks for a bit before announcing all in for 33K. Well, I'm not folding an over pair at this point. If he's got a set or something better than my hand, he's going to have to show me. I put in the call. We elect to run it twice. And we hold on both runouts despite being up against a straight and flush draw plus the over card. So definitely some run good here for us as we take down this $84,000 pot. In the next hand, I raise it up to 500. Straddle was on. I've got King Queen on the button. Get re-raised by Dan in the straddle to 2,500. Now, if I'd open from early position, I probably would just fold King Queen offsuit versus a re-raise, but considering that I raised the button, I feel like Dan could be pretty wide here. So I decide to call in position, and we go heads up to a flop of Queen 9-9 with two spades. We've got top pair, great kicker, backdoor spade draw, if you will. Dan continues for a small bet. I make the call, don't see any point in raising or folding, and we go to the eight of hearts on the turn. Dan continues betting now for around half pot, 5,700 bucks, and I'm not necessarily loving the situation at this point. My hand looks exactly like what it is, and we could easily be up against jack-10 suited, maybe any nine, maybe an over pair, pocket queens even once in a while. But of course, Dan could be bluffing, and we've got a good bluff catcher, so I make the call, and we go to the six of clubs on the river. Pot is now 21,000 and Dan puts in a bet of 16,800 bucks, a pretty chunky bet. And once more, Dan surprises me with his play because I figured he would definitely be checking a lot of value hands on this river since I could have straights, I could have a set, I could have trips, etc. So seems pretty thin to be going for value in this spot. Also seems a little bit crazy to go for a bluff. But yeah, here we are once more in a difficult spot. I think about it for a bit and eventually just realize that despite my hand being pretty strong, it's actually probably the worst hand I would ever have in this particular river situation. We do have to fold some hands and I feel like this is the best candidate to do it. So I eventually let it go reluctantly, but I'm happy to see that we were in some trouble as Dan had himself pocket kings. All right, this next one is probably the hand of the night. Suited Superman opens to 300. Nick Airball re-raises in the small blind. He makes it 1,500. And I look down at pocket fours in the big blind on his direct left. Now I'll be the first to admit cold calling with small pocket pairs, not a good play whatsoever. 
But on the flip side, you can occasionally win a huge pot if you hit a set versus an overpair. And we're also on stream. This is a game where I like to give action when I can. So I make questionable plays here and there, as I'm sure you guys know. This is one of those times I flick in the 1500 and suited Superman calls as the original Razor. So we're going three ways to a flop, which comes down above average. You could say it's 8-4-4. Four, four. That's right, we flopped four of a kind with pocket fours. I'm starting to understand why Rampage loves this hand so much. Anyway, Nick continues betting for 2,000. I could raise right away, but I decided to just call. We're also three ways, so probably shouldn't be raising too often. Suited Superman makes the call as well, and we see the six of spades on the turn. We still have the nuts, believe it or not. Nick Airball continues betting, this time $7,000. I'm more than happy to see this, as he's gotten called by two players on the flop and is still continuing to put chips in the pot. No complaints on my end. Similar to the flop, we can raise now and try to build the pot or call and see if suited Superman sticks around or maybe even puts in a raise himself. So I decided to do that. I call suited Superman, makes a nice fold with his over pair. Pocket nines go into the muck. So we're off to a river, which is the 10 of spades. Now we no longer have the nuts as nine seven of spades is a straight flush, but probably don't need to worry about that. Expecting Nick to check almost always now, but much to my surprise, he puts in another bet, 13,500 bucks. Not really sure what he's got. Maybe a backdoor flush, seems unlikely. Maybe just an overpair going for some really thin value, hoping I call him with something worse. I don't really know. What I do know is I've got four of a kind, so I am, of course, gonna raise. I make it $55,000 to go after a little bit of thought. And Nick Airball does not snap fold, which is good news to me. I'm hoping he might even raise, say he's got like pocket tens or pocket eights, that would be pretty damn sweet. But after a bit, it seems like he doesn't have those hands because he seems torn between calling or folding. I just sit there, hoping he calls, obviously, biding my time. In the past, Nick Airball has almost always made the right decision against me, so I'm kind of expecting it to go that way again. But then he suddenly makes the call. That is good news to me. He's keeping me honest in case I'm turning an eight or some sort of two pair into a bluff. Not this time, Nick. I've actually got four of a kind. And just like that, we are going to be winning this nearly $135,000 pot. Very nice. And with that, we transition nicely to this very interesting hand that came up a little bit later where Nick opens to 500 in late position and I re-raise him on the button with 10-7 offsuit. I make it $2,000 to go. Now you might be wondering, why are you doing this? I am also wondering that. But we go to a flop of 9-8-6 with two spades. So we can instantly forget all the pre-flop decision making. We have flopped the nuts. Nick airball checks, and this is a board I should probably check often or bet big on. But with that in mind, I decide to do something a little bit weird and bet small, hoping to induce a check raise from either a value hand or, of course, any bluff that Nick might have, which I think would be a plenty on a board like this. So I put in 1500 bucks, and sure enough, he check raises to 6000 Music to my ears, of course, as we've got the best possible hand. I consider raising again for a little bit, as weird as that sounds, but I decided to just keep it normal and call in position. So we go to a turn. I'm looking for a brick, of course, but that's not what we get. It's the 10 of spades. Terrible card. The most obvious flush draw gets there, of course, and any seven is now a straight. So even if we do still have the best hand, it's going to be easier for him to get away. Nick continues, though. He puts in another $6,000. Pretty small compared to the size of the pot. I make the call. Again, no point in raising now, I think. And we see an even worse river. It's the six of clubs pairing the board. So what looked like a great situation on the flop has now become essentially just a bluff catcher for me. And bluff catching is what we're going to have to do because he now puts in $50,000 into this nearly 30K pot. A huge overbet. And yeah, not loving it. We don't have any removal to full houses. I mean, yeah, we have a 10, but it's really just irrelevant since all his full houses would consist of two pair and sets on the flop based on how we've played the hand. We do have some removal to flushes, but I just don't think he's got a flush because he probably wouldn't go huge on the river with a flush. So yeah, realistically, I think we're either going to call and beat a bluff 
or call and lose to a full house. Of course, we could also fold since we lose to a bunch of hands now. It's a tough spot. Maybe for you guys, this looks straightforward, but as I'm sure many of you know, Nick is capable of bluffing with some random crap from time to time. So I do give this one a fair amount of thought. But in the end, I decide we've just probably got to let this one go. We're going to have full houses and just better hands to call with myself. So I reluctantly lay it down. And luckily, that was the right choice as we would have lost 50K if I decided to get curious. Nice hand, Nick. Seems a little bit fair after the uh, pocket fours debacle. We give some money back here. And with that, we move to the last interesting hand of stream number one, but stay tuned for the second stream. In this one, Dylan opens up to 300. Suited Superman makes it 1,000 on his left, and it gets to me in the big blind with king-queen offsuit. Now, I think almost always you should just fold based on the early position raise and then suited Superman re-raising that. But I also think king-queen offsuit is a good candidate to occasionally squeeze with pre-flop. We've got removal to pocket kings, pocket queens, ace-king and ace-queen, all sorts of strong stuff they can have. And I think suited Superman could be going after Dylan a little bit light here since Dylan has been having a rough night. So I decide to pounce on this. I make it 2,800 to go. Dylan calls and then suited Superman also calls. So not really what I was expecting, but here we go. Three ways out of position to a flop of four deuce deuce with one heart. We've got two overs and the king of hearts, but more importantly, this is a pretty dry board. And considering that I put in that last raise pre-flop, I'm pretty much the only guy who should have aces, kings, and queens. So I'm going to play it as such. I start with a bet of 4,500 bucks around half pot. Dylan lets go of his king, queen of diamonds, which makes sense. Not much going on for him, but suited Superman has pocket fives. He's going nowhere just yet. Turn card comes the 10 of spades, and just like I said on the flop, if I had a big pocket pair, which I typically would in this situation, given the pre-flop action, I would continue betting for value, trying to target smaller pocket pairs exactly like the one he's got here. Now, of course, this time I don't have one of those pairs, but the same principle applies. So I continue for a bet of 11K, trying to set up a decent sized all-in on the river. Seems like suited Superman wants none of that. He just lets it go, which I think is reasonable. You know, pocket fives in a spot like that seems kind of annoying to try to hang on with. So he lets it go and we get away with this bluff to end the stream. Now that brings us nicely into day two. Here we're going to start with 7-4 of diamonds in late position. Pretty bad hand, but it's a suited connector, sort of. So I open it up to 400 and we get re-raised by Jew on the button to 1500. Folds back around to me, and well, we sh probably shouldn't have been in this hand to begin with, much less calling a re-raise out of position with it. But as you guys can probably guess, if it's in the vlog, I decided to continue. So I make the call, hoping that we get a good board, like, you know, low cards or diamonds, something like that. But that's not really what we get, it's ace, 10, 6. However, there are two diamonds, so despite the fact that this board is better for him, we do have a flush draw. I check it, expecting him to continue betting, but he does not. He checks it back, and we get a great turn card. It's the 9 of clubs, giving me a straight draw to go along with our flush draw. Now, given the fact that we both check the flop, if I had something super strong on this turn, like most obviously 7-8 suited for the turn straight, I would be betting quite big. And I think doing that with a bluff also makes sense to balance out, you know, the times that I have something good. So I put in 4,800 bucks, which is around 150% pot. Jew thinks for a bit, but really he's got no choice but to call after checking back top pair on the flop. So that's what he does. Looking for some improvement on the river, but we don't get it. It's the three of hearts. So we're stuck here with seven high and a dream. But the truth is, I feel like this hand sort of plays itself. I know that seems a little bit weird to say, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, if I had something strong, I would bet for value. So that makes me feel comfortable and also bluffing the times that we've missed a big hand like this. A combo draw, you know, sometimes you just got to bluff and try to win the pot. Now, in terms of sizing, this is where things get a little bit weird. I feel like an overbet is once more in order. Probably around... $18,000, maybe $24,000. I 
But what I failed to realize here is exactly how much Ju had in his stack. For whatever reason, I thought he had like 30K and I didn't want to make it too obvious by like staring at his stack multiple times throughout the hand. So I decided to just shove all in, thinking it was around 25, maybe 30. Turns out it was like 45K, which is a huge bet. It's like triple pot, kind of ridiculous. But it seems like maybe it's exactly the firepower that we needed because Ju is now in a miserable situation with Ace Queen. Kind of a tough hand to call with. It's just one pair, and you also have removal to Queen Jack, which is one of those missed straight draws. But he doesn't fold right away, takes his time, thinks it over. In the end, however, he does let it go. So maybe the fact that he had more worked out in our favor, but this was kind of a kamikaze bluff, something I hardly ever do. I think it's probably my first time all year doing something that silly. And it kind of was based on a miscalculation, plus the fact that I played a bad hand pre-flop. Lesson learned, I guess. And, you know, you guys get to learn that lesson for free just by watching. Don't play terrible hands and then bet 45000 with nothing on the river. Probably not going to work out well long term, but this time it does and we avoid disaster. All right, moving on to this next hand where Alec Torelli opens to 300. And I look down at a real hand this time, Ace King on the button. I make it a thousand. And then Ju, same opponent as last hand, he makes it 3500 from the small blind. Now we are playing the stand-up game, and I feel like Ju might be a little frazzled from that last hand. So definitely going to continue with Ace King, of course. That's needless to say. It's just a matter of do we want to re-raise or call in position. And I feel like both have merit. Probably leaning towards call a little bit more, but this time I take the aggressive route and put in another raise. I make it 8K to go. Ju, as you guys can see, is not frazzled at all. Cool as a cucumber, he's got himself pocket aces and decides to just call, leaving me in an awkward spot where I'm probably going to lose some more money at least. Flop comes down 10-8-4, rainbow. He checks, and I decide to check it back. Probably should be betting, but I decide to check it back, and we see the four of diamonds on the turn. Ju now bets really tiny, 3300 bucks, and if he's got, say, a hand like ace 10 suited or pocket jacks maybe even pocket queens we're getting a decent price to float in position and try to improve so i put in the money we see the seven of hearts on the river we've got nothing but ace high so despite the fact that ju now leads out for a super tiny bet of 4200 i'm not interested in paying him off so i let it go and at least you could say we didn't get it all in pre-flop which might have happened Luckily, we don't lose too much in this one. But yeah, sucks to run ace-king into pocket aces regardless. Moving right along, however, we've got more hands to go over. How about ace-king again? And also versus Alec Torelli. In this one, he opens up to 500. The $200 straddle was on. I re-raise again, this time from the small blind. And Alec has $10,000 in his stack total and decides it is all going in there. All in for exactly 10,600. I, of course, snap call since we've got a real hand this time. Ace King is pretty damn good, even if we did just lose with it. We're going to go to two runouts. On the first one, we hit top pair, top kicker. But on the second one, despite hitting top pair, top kicker again, Alec flops trips with Ace Jack of Hearts. That is a little bit of a bad beat considering he already hit a Jack on the first runout. So pretty crazy, but I guess it's not too bad. You know, Ace Jack suited versus Ace King off. You're going to chop here and there. That's totally fine. So yeah, twice we get ace king and twice we can't win a pot. Let's see if we can get some redemption with, guess what hand? Ace king. That's right. We get it a third time a few minutes later. And this one, Alec limps in for 100 bucks. I look down at ace king. Again, it seems every time Alec throws chips in the pot, I get dealt ace king. I make it 500. Jew calls 500. Dylan calls 500, gets back to Alec, and he springs the trap with his pocket kings. The old limp re-raise straight out of the OMC handbook. He makes it 3K to go. Again, he's only got like 10K, so I decide to just make it 10K, get it all in there. Alec, of course, has the ideal situation, all in preflop with pocket kings versus, you know, not aces. We once again decide to run it twice. In the first board, kings hold. But in the second board, there's three clubs on the flop and then another club on the turn. We've got the king of clubs, and Alec does not, so we end up chopping again. But in the end, that's 0 for 3 with ace king. Couldn't win one time. Because of that, I decide to play a different hand. 
pocket jacks. Might as well start with a pair since ace-king isn't working out. This hand is also a lot weirder than those ace-king hands, in my opinion. Brown Baller limps in for 100. I make it 400 to go. And then Henry re-raises on the button to 1,100. Gets back around to Brown Baller, and he cold calls the 1,100. Back to me, and considering that Henry raises pretty wide and Brown Baller cold called, I think jacks are worthy of putting in more chips. So I make it 6,000 to go. Back on Henry, he's on the button. He makes the call with a playable hand. That's no surprise. But then Brown Baller calls again. So Brown Baller goes for the old triple call pre-flop. Not something you see every day. I feel like that's an achievement or something. But either way, we go three ways to a flop of 8-6-4 rainbow. Brown Baller decides now to lead out for $6,000. Very odd, considering all the raising that happened pre-flop. I feel like leading on good flops isn't really a thing in, uh, well, let's not get too nerdy. Anyway, he's got 20 or something left behind, 20,000, so I decided to do something super weird and put in a tiny raise in hopes of getting Henry out with whatever equity he might have and just going heads up with a Bala. If he's got me beat, I'm willing to live with it. But if we've got the best hand, I'm totally okay just going all in versus him. So that's what ends up happening. Henry folds. Looking back, I think this is kind of a disastrous raise by me on the flop, I should say, because if Henry's got something super strong, which he could have, you know, a set or a slow played aces or kings type hand, then we are just building this pot in a really weird situation. But anyway, that's not what happens. Henry folds and Brown Bala decides to call so we're going to a turn, which is the queen of clubs. Pretty much a brick, it seems. And he's only got 12k behind. The pot is now like 48. So no brainer all in on my behalf. If he's got me beat, so be it. But it seems he doesn't because he now goes into the tank. Really weird situation. It's 12,000 for him to call and the pot is 60k. So I'm really surprised to even see him contemplate folding. But in the end, that's actually exactly what he does. He lets it go with his pocket sevens which I don't even know if that's right. It seems like he was almost getting a price to call with his like 19% chance to win. I'm not sure what happened here, but I'm more than okay with him just letting it go and letting us have this pot, which is what happens here. And we end up profiting around 27K. Lesson to be learned here is pocket jacks are better than ace king. Who would have known? In this next one, we downgrade slightly from pocket jacks to pocket tens. Here, Kent raises to 800. Alec puts in a re-raise on the button to 2400 and I look down at pocket tens in the blinds. Once again, Alec has a short stack, a little less than 10k or so, maybe a little over. So I just decide, well, pocket tens, pretty good hand, especially for 10k. It seems like all the numbers are adding up. Good vibes, you know? So I put in the 10k, gets back around to Alec now with king jack off suit, and he is in a tough spot because even though his hand isn't great, I could be getting out of line with something like, you know, ace five suited, and he wouldn't be in that bad of shape against that hand. And of course, if I got a pocket pair below the jack, then it's just a flip. He's getting an okay price. It's 7,600 into 13K. Yeah, I don't know, it's close. But in the end, he decides to gamble and toss the money in there. And it's best case scenario for him as he's got two overs, so 50-50. We elect to run it twice once again. And this time, we hold on the first board. And then we hold on the second board. So we win a nice one here. 23,000 headed our way. And Alec gets a little unlucky in this spot. And with that, we move to the last interesting hand of today's session. In this one, Kent opens up the action to 800. I look down at Ace Jack in the third blind and think it's probably worthy of a raise since big cards perform well versus smaller stacks. And Kent's only got 13K, so I make it 3,000 to go. Back around to Kent, he decides he's had enough. He makes it all in for 14K. I'm not in love with the situation, but Kent has been a really cool sport all night, and I'm happy to give some action here. He also needs a button for the stand-up game, so he might be a little bit looser than normal. Turns out we're flipping, once again, ace-jack offsuit versus pocket nines. On the first one, we flop all sorts of outs with queen, 10, 5, two hearts out there but we don't improve on the turn or river on the second board however we hit a jack and then he doesn't hit a nine at any point so we chop it up kind of a no-brainer hand but you know there was nearly 30k in the middle so i figured it was worth going over just a bunch of flipping and straightforward hands today 
not quite as action heavy as stream number one, but regardless, as always, I hope you all enjoyed the hands. So the game just finished as you guys can probably tell I don't look so good But I'm happy to report that we won in fact we won. I think it was oh There go the lights. I think it was Nine to seven or nine to six Lots of goals in these uh, shorthanded indoor games. So that's always fun scored a few myself But anyway as I said earlier this channel is not about soccer unfortunately, but instead about gambling also happy to report that we took some dubs in that category as well. Both of the sessions that you guys watched were positive results for myself. In total between the two, I think I won around... Actually, I'm not even going to guess because I don't remember. I'm filming this like a week later, so I'm not entirely sure. But I think it was somewhere between 50 and 100k uh, profit between both of those sessions. More than okay with me, of course, especially considering the uh, tough run I had to end 2023. So. All in all, 2024 is going just fine. Lots of dubs on the soccer field, lots of dubs on the poker felt. Let's see if we can keep that going uh, and then we'll have another good year. But yeah, that's all I got for you guys today. Hope you enjoyed the uh, quads hand. You don't see that too often. And yeah, that's all I got. So as always, thank you for watching. If you gave this video a thumbs up, much appreciated. And I'll see you all next time. Until then, good luck at the tables. Peace. <laughs>